are sex and love intrinsically connected? Because when I used to teach sex ed to groups of horny teenagers with hormones at their peaks, they pretty much always answered yes. Now, though, I'm a leadership expert and an executive coach, but when I'm in our organizations, it seems to me that a lot of us have held on to those pubescent beliefs, and as a result, we have banned both love and sex from our professional lives. Now, I'm sure you can all agree with me that you can have sex without love, and you can have love without sex. So while I'm totally on board with the fact that you cannot have sex at work, can somebody please tell me why we can't have love? It's baffling to me that the most meaningful human connection we have is intentionally exiled from the place where we spend the most time together, our workplaces. And leadership literature these days is full of references to belonging and empathy and shared values and psychological safety, but, but love, the highest form of all of those things, remains largely absent from the leadership discussion. And sure, you might hear somebody in the office say, I love those sales numbers, Addie. <laughs> but you're not going to hear someone say, I love you, Jake, at the end of a board meeting. But w why not? Isn't it paradoxical, don't you think, that as we seek to foster stronger bonds at work, we actively refrain from using the one word we've got that represents the strongest of those bonds? Maybe the word is the problem. You know, love is both incredibly meaningful and impossibly imprecise. Like, I can say, I love my children on the committed side, and I love chocolate on the casual side, uh, and neither end of the child chocolate spectrum has anything even remotely to do with sex or romance. So, so why is it that we can't find something, you know, here <laughs> that we can use to platonically and safely incorporate love at work? You know, the ancient Greeks had it better. They had six distinct words for love, one of which was philia, which represents a kind of strong friendship bond. And I think that's exactly the kind of love that we need in our working environments. But no, in English, we've got the poverty of the one word, love. I find it ironic that as a Canadian, I can easily think of like 20 different words to describe snow, but I'm still stuck with just one word when it comes to expressing love. Interestingly, our aversion to using emotional language at work goes well beyond just the word love. I mean, think about how we refer to our colleagues, at, I'm sorry, our human capital. Capital managed by the Human Resources Department. Except that we're not capital, are we? We're not resources, we're not numbers on a graph. Humans are weird and wonderful and creative and loving and caring and giving, but also kind of mean and terrible and awful to each other sometimes. And if you're married like I am, it could be also the same person and all on the same day. Just ask my wife. <laughs> we try so hard to, to improve business efficiency by squeezing the humanity out of our human resources in order to manipulate people into productivity. But I just don't think that dehumanization is our best strategy for productivity. And at worst, it has the potential to destroy lives. A humble French guy named Remy Louvredoux is a really good example of this. Remy dedicated 30 years of his life to France Telecom. On the surface, it looked like he had an amazing opportunity in that company. It was Remy's job to look after employee mental health. Except the company had an objective to slash its work workforce by 20%. Get this, by making their employees so miserable that they would quit on their own accord. The CEO reportedly said that they will leave through the window or through the door. Well, Remy wrote endless letters, day after day, complaining about the poor workplace conditions. And you know what happened? They moved him to a windowless, prison cell-type office, no phone, no computer, and they simply ignored him. Well, he felt worthless, denigrated demoralized. 
On Tuesday, April 26, 2011, Remy kissed his wife goodbye and he sent his kids off to school and he drove himself to work and lit himself on fire in the parking lot of his office, killing himself just days before his daughter's 18th birthday. And Remy was not alone. The labor union reported 60 employee suicides at France Telecom in a span of just five years. That's one employee leaving through the window instead of the door every month for five straight years in just one company. And I wish, I wish I could tell you that France Telecom was an exceptional case, but it's really not. The terrible truth is that if we continue to treat each other like soulless, replaceable cogs in the workplace machine, horrible outcomes like this are the painful result. There's no doubt that the absence of love at work comes at too high of a cost. Did you know research is telling us now that employees who don't have much say in what they do for work or how they do it are 21% more likely to die in general and 50% more likely to die of heart disease specifically than those that do. That is the human cost of low job control. And on the financial side, a study of 400 different companies, each with 100,000 employees in it, found that misunderstandings alone cost those companies on average $62 million dollars every year. That's the cost of employees not feeling understood. Look, in order to feel loved, you first have to be valued, right? In order to feel valued, you first have to be understood. In order to feel understood, you first have to be heard. In order to feel heard, you first need to be included. And I know there's so much on diversity and equity and inclusion these days, but, but that is the baseline here. Right? Inclusion is level one in psychological safety. That is where we need to start if we're going to build that ladder all the way up to love. And love is not just a nice to have. It's not an option. It's not new. It's not a patch you wear on your sleeve or a printed t-shirt. Hey, we've got love at work. Huh? No, this is as old as humanity itself. Our ancestors survived this planet by knowing who to trust, who was going to provide for them and protect them when they're not looking. And we call that Love, that is what we've kicked out of our organizations. It's that communal best practice for survival that bonds us to each other. That is what we've kicked out of the office, the highest form of psychological safety. So it's no surprise then that employees that do feel loved at work, well, they have less stress. They're happier, they're healthier, and they statistically live longer lives. Also, they're much more likely to crack a well-meaning joke at the office water cooler, too. And that all makes sense because, you know, if you feel loved at work, there's going to be higher levels of trust and collaboration and creativity, and that's going to drive your performance, right? Oh, do you want to know how um, loved up people impact the bottom line? Because there's science for that, too. It's happy science. Uh, okay, here's one. One study showed that in a company where, let's say, 40% of its employees claim to have a best friend at work would increase that number from 40% to 60%, that company's bottom line would grow by 12%. That, in many cases, that's millions and millions of dollars just from people feeling like they've got a bestie in the office, right? Another study showed that in some companies, up to 64% of their employees now say that they have a work spouse. Have you heard of this? It's somebody at work that, you know, you're transparent with and loyal to, kind of like your spouse at home, but it's not romantic and it's not sexual. Oh, uh, speaking of sexual, as gender balance is going up, which is a good thing, sexual harassment cases are actually coming down, which is another good thing. That's right. As men and women are working together more often and more closely, we're actually experiencing a lot less sexual tension in the office. And I know, I know sexual harassment is still a serious issue, yes, and it deserves serious repercussions, but that is not what I'm talking about here. I shouldn't have to say out loud, but sexual harassment has absolutely nothing at all to do with love. We just haven't acknowledged the fact that you can have love without sex, and I think we need to mature out of that, and I think this is our opportunity to do it, because, well, let's face it, love is already at work, even if we pretend that it isn't. Oh, I know. 
I know, I see you, all of you can think back to somebody that you've worked with before and you would say, yes, absolutely, I love that person. Even if you never told them out loud and it wasn't romantic or sexual and it definitely fit on the child chocolate spectrum. Okay, well, I challenge you now. Next time you feel that way about a colleague, be authentic. Say it out loud. I love you. Come on, it's not that scary. I'll bet you don't need me to teach you how to express love, right? Because you are the product of 10,000 iterations of a successfully improving love machine. Yes, that's right. All of your ancestors earned you the right to be born by knowing who loved them and knowing who didn't. So you were hardwired for this. And all you have to do is put into practice what your heart already understands. So no, we don't need to teach love. We don't need to define love. We don't need to put it in our employee handbooks or our policy manuals. And we definitely do not need to outsource this to the legal department. And I don't think we should commoditize love either because otherwise we risk like turning it into something mechanical and performative, like a tick box exercise. You know, can, you, can you imagine like on a scale of one to 10, how loving is your manager? <laughs> Oh, and don't even get me started on the idea of a chief loving officer in the C-suite either. Okay, C-L-O. Uh. <laughs> Honestly, if we do that, we, we risk like devolving this into something fake instead of a genuine expression of care and compassion for each other. But I'll tell you what, what I think we should do. And here's where I'm going to need your help. I would like us to start a pro-love movement at work. Oh, I know, we can all just like start by being a little bit more loving with each other, but I have something much more practical in mind, okay. A little while ago, I started to sign off all of my emails. Love, Corey. <laughs> no more sincerely, no more warm wishes, no more best regards, okay, to everyone. Strangers, suppliers, clients, friends, Members of the royal family, ministers of government, love, Corey. I was just like, I just decided that in some small way, I wanted to insert a teeny little bit of love into everything that I did through email. I have been doing this for two years now, okay? Nobody seems to mind. I haven't been reported to any HR departments that I'm aware of. So now I think the experiment is a success, and I feel very comfortable, very confident, inviting you to join in. Oh, come on, what do you think is going to happen? Huh? If you just sign off all of your emails, love Susan or love Henry. Oh, but what do you think might happen if maybe a million of us started to do it? <laughs> and, and what do you, but what do you think might happen if maybe 10 million of us started to do it? Huh? Oh, and I also want you to think in terms of a love bias at work as well. You can think of it in terms of like wearing a set of rose-colored glasses in the office. What is the most loving approach that you can take towards your boss or towards your employees? Ooh, if you're on the board of directors, what is the most loving way to steward the resources available to your organization? If you're the CEO of a major, major multinational, what is the most loving way to lead your people? Or what is the most lovingly profitable strategy that you can pursue? And I know we have so much talk about artificial intelligence these days, but what if, what if we put some of our least artificial intelligence back into our analyses as well. Like, can we think in terms of the most loving way to interpret a data set or balance a spreadsheet? Ultimately, whatever it is that you're facing at work, I just want it to occur to you to ask yourself, what would love do? And just try and do that. And imagine how much better your life would be if you felt loved at work and how much those around you would excel if they felt loved as well. And if you're doing better and they're doing better, surely the entire organization as a whole would start to thrive, right? But, you know, love is a choice. And remember, it's not strange, it's not weird. I am asking you to do what makes you most human in the place where you spend the most time with other humans. And that is the most natural thing I can think of. Khalil Gibran once said that work is love made visible, and I couldn't agree more. We need to flood the darkest corners of our companies with the brightest light that we have. 
the highest form of empathy and belonging and shared values and psychological safety because if we do, if we infuse our attitudes, actions, and contributions with love, we create the kinds of economic environments where our humans, not resources, live happier, healthier, longer lives, and our companies make more money. It's high time that we find that sweet spot on the child chocolate spectrum and we learn to normalize love at work. And I will go first. I love you. It's your turn. <laughs>